No one can ignore a woman with a gun. I'll take two. And there are a lot of gun-toting women in Israel, which means that the women of the IDF come in for a lot of objectification. That's what I love about these girls. In the 70s, Playboy praised Israel as the land of milk and honeys. After all, what is the most important ambition of any girl? Isn't it to keep her gun scrupulously clean? Decades later, Maxim asked, are the women of the IDF the world's sexiest soldiers? Oh, you got well. But Israel's female soldiers aren't femme fatales. They carry weapons not to arouse, but to defend. And they've helped shape Israel's military since before the modern state officially existed. So who are these brave women, ignored by history books and fetishized by pop culture? Here are five stories you need to know. Number one, Sarah Aronson. The first woman on our list wasn't an Israeli per se, because there was no Israel in her lifetime. Sarah Aronson lived in Ottoman-ruled Palestine. During a brief sojourn in Turkey, she had witnessed the cruelty of the Ottoman genocide of the Armenian people. By the time she came back to Palestine, Ottoman officials had begun deporting thousands of Jewish residents and threatening to make Palestine a second Armenia. Not if Sarah had anything to say about it. But she didn't need a gun to defend her people. She just needed a pigeon. See, Sarah's brother Aaron hated the Ottomans as much as she did. So he formed a spy ring called Neely, collecting information on the Ottomans and passing it on to the British. The Aronsons weren't Anglophiles, they were Zionists. And they knew the Brits were their best chance of ousting the Ottomans from Palestine so they could build a Jewish homeland at last. While her brother Aaron built contacts with Allied intelligence around the region, Sarah oversaw nearly 40 odd spies in Palestine, coordinating the spy ring's activities, managing finances, and handling the encoding and decoding of intelligence reports, which were delivered via carrier pigeon. It was a dangerous job and Sarah knew the risks. Still, she insisted on remaining in Palestine against everyone's advice. And then came the day when one of Neely's carrier pigeons was caught, and the spy ring was exposed. British intelligence tipped Sarah off that the Ottomans were after her, but instead of fleeing, Sarah remained in Palestine to make sure her fellow spies all dispersed safely. On October 1st, 1917, the Turks arrested Sarah, and they were determined to make her talk. They tortured her father before her eyes, burned her body, crushed her fingers, and whipped the soles of her feet. Still, she wouldn't give in. The only thing she told her interrogators was that she'd worked alone and that she couldn't wait to see their downfall. What a boss. When they realized they couldn't break her, the Ottomans decided to transfer Sarah to the professionals in Damascus who would surely make her talk. But Sarah knew what was at stake. So before she was set to leave for Damascus, she asked her captors if she could rush home to change her bloody clothes. Surprisingly, they agreed. But Sarah wasn't just trying to clean herself up. She was getting her gun. She scribbled a hasty note to her brothers asking them to take their revenge. And then she shot herself. For days, she hovered between life and death. She died in agony at the age of 27, secure in the knowledge that she hadn't broken. The story of Sarah Aronson spread like wildfire among Palestine's Jews. She was Zionism's first female martyr, a symbol of the ultimate sacrifice, something close to a saint. People still make annual pilgrimages to her grave. But I think that Sarah was a lot more than a symbol. She was a human being who died too young to see her dream of an independent Israel come true. Number two, Devorah Drechler. Fast forward to the end of World War I, the nearly spiring got their wish. In 1918, British-led forces defeated the Ottomans and gained control over Palestine. Right away, the Brits and French got busy divvying up the land. Immediately following the war, parts of northern Palestine went to the French, and neither the Jews nor the Arabs of the region were particularly happy about that. The Jews tried to lie low and remain neutral, but many of them were immigrants from Europe, and local Arabs suspected them of collaborating with France. Tensions rose, and local Jewish settlements turned to a Jewish militia called Hashomer for support. Among the Hashomer members was a young Ukrainian immigrant named Dvor Drechler. From the moment she arrived in Palestine at age 17, Dvor worked to make the Zionist dream a reality. Under the Ottomans, she'd bring food and information to Hashomer members confined to the Turkish prison in Nazareth. But she wanted to do more than just support Hashomer. She wanted to fight. In 1918, she led a women's revolt, threatening that the women of Hashomer would cease working altogether unless the men included them in security duties and agricultural work. And because life on the Oshav was hard, and they really did need all hands on deck, the men agreed, reluctantly. So when Devor rode in to defend the settlement of Tel Chai, she and another female fighter, Sarah Chizik, were assigned to defend the top floor of the village's main building. Dvor was at her post when a group of more than 100 Arab villagers and militiamen demanded to search the courtyard for French soldiers. No one really knows what happened next, except that it was chaos. Some say that the battle started when the Arabs tried to wrest away Devor's gun, shooting her when she resisted. The tensions burst into open fighting, and at the end of the battle, eight Jewish defenders, including Devora, were dead. Jewish communities throughout Palestine and Europe awarded Devora and Sarah special recognition, circulating postcards with their images, and even building a statue entitled The Galilee and Its Female Guardians. Like Sarah Aronson, Devora too became part of the Zionist mythos. 
But in time, other names like the famous war hero Yosef Trumpeldor, who also fell in the Battle of Tel Chai, overshadowed hers, and Devorah became just another fallen comrade. Number 3. Miriam Shachol the Brits solidified their control over Palestine in 1920 in a mandate sanctioned by the newly created League of Nations. Over the next three decades, three organized Jewish paramilitaries worked to protect the Jewish community and fight for an independent Jewish homeland. The biggest of the three, and the only one recognized by the official Jewish community in Palestine, or the Yishuv, was the Haganah, and its elite combat brigade, the Palmach, was the cream of the crop. Today, the Palmach Museum hails its male and female heroes, but like the women of Hashomer, the women of the Palmach had to work to be included at all. Women only began joining the Haganah in 1925, five years after its establishment. They served in support roles, like providing first aid and transporting weapons. But at the end of World War II, the women who had volunteered to serve in the British Army returned home, eager to fight for a Jewish state. Among them was a young recruit named Miriam Shachol, who was born in Jerusalem to passionately Zionist parents. A dedicated fighter, she was accepted to the elite ranks of the Palmach, and soon found herself guarding a water pipeline in the Negev Desert in a unit of nine soldiers. On the night of December 9, 1947, a Bedouin gang ambushed Miriam's unit. Desperate to buy time and allow her comrades to escape, Miriam threw her two grenades and ran. But the Bedouins shot her as well as two of her fellow soldiers. But she didn't die immediately. Bleeding profusely, she tried to drag herself away from her attackers. But that wasn't the end of her ordeal. According to the officer who found them, Miriam and her comrades' bodies were bullet-ridden, with apparent signs of abuse. They were so severely mutilated that they became impossible to identify or separate, and had to be buried in a mass grave. One officer claimed that even the devil could not create such a horror. Miriam's gruesome killing changed everything for the women fighting for Israel. Following her death, Palmach headquarters ordered the immediate removal of women from combat positions. Miriam Shachol became a cautionary tale, a frustrating barrier for the women who came after her who wanted to fight like she did. Number four, Alice Miller. Women were largely prohibited from serving in combat roles until the 1990s, when Alice Miller took the military to the Supreme Court and won. Alice had always been passionate about aviation. After high school, she pursued a civilian pilot license and a degree in aerospace engineering. But her real dream was to be an astronaut. And to do that, she needed to join the Israel Air Force, or IAF. There was only one problem. The Israeli military's pilot program was closed to women. The men running the Israeli military didn't want to think of what could happen to a female pilot shot down over enemy territory. But 23-year-old Alice was undaunted. Combat soldiers know and accept the risks, she argued. And she took that argument all the way to Israel's Supreme Court in 1995, where she petitioned for her right to apply to be a combat pilot. And in a historic vote, the Supreme Court lifted the ban on female combat pilot recruits. While Alice herself never actually did take on the pilot role because of medical issues, her resolve opened the door for thousands of women after her. She moved the conversation forward, not just about female combat pilots, but about women in combat positions as a whole. Number five, Major General Yifat Tomer Yerushalmi. The Military Advocate General Corps, or MAG Corps, goes all the way back to the times of the Haganah. This corps is responsible for ensuring that all of the IDF's commanders and soldiers abide by the rule of law. And if soldiers commit some type of offense, well, the MAG Corps is the body that prosecutes them. As military advocate general, Major General Yifat Tomer Yerushalmi sits above the three branches of the IDF and serves as the highest legal authority in the Israeli military. Her decisions bind every unit in the IDF, a position that her female predecessors could hardly have imagined. Her credentials are impressive, dual master's degrees in law and over 25 years of legal experience in the MAG Corps. But make no mistake, Tomer Yerushalmi's job is not about glory and power. As military advocate general, she supervises all disciplinary proceedings in the IDF. She also works on cases of international law, like assessing the IDF's role in the death of Al Jazeera journalist Shirin Abu Akleh in May 2022. She's seen and dealt with terrorists, suicide bombings, murder cases, and administrative detention cases. But that's not all. As the Gender Affairs Advisor to the Chief of Staff, she oversaw cases of sexual harassment and gender discrimination and provided support to religious female soldiers. Like the women who came before her, Tome Yerushalmi is a trailblazer shaping the IDF's character. Israeli women in the military have trudged through a long and winding path, one largely determined by men in power. But these women never gave up, and thanks to their efforts, Israel's position towards women in combat has continued to evolve. Each of these five women laid the groundwork for the next. It's important to tell their stories, to remember them not just as larger-than-life myths, but as real human beings who paved the way for future women, sometimes with their own blood.